Hey everybody, welcome back to this series where I go through various RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one I'm going to be doing three dungeons for Shadow Dark, three adventures for Shadow Dark, all by Sursa Victory, who is a, I think he's done stuff for 5e and he's done stuff for other independent games before. Um, he has a bunch of free dungeons, adventures that you can find um, on, well I'll, I'll link to his uh, link tree below in the, in the uh, dis description so you can see all of his stuff. But he has great ideas in these. Now, first of all, they're, they're, they're free, right? So they're worth it, obviously. Um, but even so, leaving that aside, they're great dungeons. They're great adventures. And they have a lot of great ideas for you if you wanted to mimic them or, or use them to make your own or just, you know, plunk them right into your campaigns, use them as one shots, whatever. They have a lot of really cool concepts and he has put a lot of thought into how he builds them. In, in fact, he has a document called the Cyclic Dungeon Generation. Um, or it's just called Cyclic Dungeon Generation. And he goes through his theory about how to create dungeons and what you want to do and various sort of models that you can use. And then he goes through a particular example, which is this particular dungeon, Tomb of the Dusk Queen. So I'll show you this adventure and then I'll show you really briefly his Cyclic Dungeon Generation document. And then I'll go on to the other two adventures by him that I'm going to be covering in this video. So let's go through it. First of all, it says an introductory dungeon delve, but it's designed for level three characters. So keep that in mind, this is not a level one, even though it says introductory, it's for level three. You could run it for level one characters, but I think it would be quite deadly. Um, there's a danger level, so uh, obviously Shadow Dark has three danger levels. Unsafe is the, uh, the easiest of the three. This is you check every three rounds. So the whole dungeon, you check every three rounds for wandering monsters. There's a D6 table for random encounters. Uh, a couple of them are really cool because they're um, sort of more role-playing encounters. Um, but the others are, are also interesting too. And some combat stuff that, that fits right into the, uh, the tone of this adventure. Um, now you have the dungeon key, and it's really, really well designed. You have a rumor table, which I'm not... I mean, I guess it goes along with the burial mound, because this is the outside. Um, but you'll, you can see it's broken down really, really well. So you have the pillars, uh, the mound itself, rotted coffin, and a phantom. Right, And so you have uh, various things that are happening here. Uh, that's in room one. That's the mound itself. Um, you can go to the map in a second here, but look at the phantom. I think this is really cool. The Veiled Dusk Queen Phantom Mourns Dead. If whales, if touched, and raises danger level to risky. So instead of every three, every two. So you have this, this chance of making the dungeon much more dangerous if you interact with this phantom. Now, I wish there was more to it. You could obviously add more to it, but it's just a little thing right there. D6 rumor table for people who know. You could ro roll one up for each character or give one to the group or something like that. But again, every room is described in this very simple way, very clear, takes a lot of inspiration from the more modern aesthetic of dungeon design, which is clear, uh, you know, no box text to read, no long descriptive paragraph, you just get bullet points and bolding and italics to get you everything you need as quickly as possible. Um, again, here's the map of the dungeon, which I just showed. Now, what's interesting about this is that it's a little bit branchy, right? You have eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 off on their own, and they don't necessarily direct the rest of the dungeon, but you get a cool loop, three, four, five, and six. And what I like is one of the things that he recommends in his dungeon design document is this one kind of dungeon where you can see a goal, but not reach it. And he has that here. There's a portcullis that's been dropped between three and six. So if you're in three, you can see down the hallway to six, but you can't get to it. And sort of in order to get to it, you have to take the side path of going through four or five, and then you can eventually make it back down to six and get something there, which I think is cool. It gives you a goal that's not necessary, but it gives you kind of an off path. And then the main route is three, seven, 13, and 14. So it's a pretty linear dungeon, but it has an option, a branch at the beginning, and then it has this sort of secondary thing going on with three, four, five, and six. Um, and so you have, uh, you can see, yeah, so in room, room three, it's the ruined idol with centipedes and then um, a mold-covered portcullis, so you can disturb it, but you have that con save or die after one delving round. So this is a deadly dungeon. You just have a save or die mold here. But, you know, for introductory, it's a good thing to introduce character here, characters to here. There's an owlbear zombie, which is awesome. Um, and then you have the heroine's tomb in five, and then six is the obelisk and the scepter, which is the scepter of the Dusk Queen, which is one of the magic items that goes with this uh, adventure. And then there's a, a trap obelisk there, and uh, which is really cool, an obelisk tomb, basically. And you go through, it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. You have an enchanted mosaic, uh, you get an 
answer truthfully one yes or no question about the tomb. It's a little bit of role playing there, a little bit of decision there. And then there's a bonfire. Um, and it says, once per adventure restores all hit points and extended expended spells if they do the bonfire thing. So that's an interesting little twist. You know, you, if you did this once, you would kind of probably want to keep doing it in your campaign. So you might not want to do it. But as an introduction, right, this might be a good way to start off. Now, I don't know why you'd start with level three characters in an introduction. But it's kind of cool. And it fits with the uh, general idea of this being an introduction. You have a moment of role playing. Ask characters what they're thinking about while they're resting in silence. It's a darkest dungeon thing, which I always like. You have a charnel basilisk, um, and then you find the crown of the Dusk Queen as well. You only have a one in six chance of finding it, so you have to kind of, or if you search during the battle, I should say. Um, and then there's the Royal Hall, the Grand Tomb of Dusk, and then there's an ending, the adventure. So if you get the scepter and the crown, it's 300 gold if you sell them as a pair. And you also find a steel door at the bottom of the well, or the locked steel at the bottom of the well, can be opened with found in the Dusk Queen sarcophagus. So then the water drains away, and you find another uh, quest that leads down beneath the Colossal Golden Tree. So you find another sort of leading into the next adventure, but that's not given to you to do. Then there's a brief description of the different monsters. These are um, created monsters. Some of them are taken from uh, the book, the Shadow Dark book, but other ones are made for this. The War Maiden Skeleton, the Owlbear Zombie, uh, an animated Mithril Armor, and then the Dusk Queen Mummy. And then you have the treasure here, a scroll of invisibility, a potion of growth, a growth, an enchanted mithril longsword, so really strong. Uh, gives you uh, a sense of when hidden crawls or secret doors are nearby, and it's a plus one weapon. You get a scroll of fireball, a scroll of lightning bolt, bolt a ring of protection, um, which is plus two AC, and you can shatter it to cancel one attack made against them. So it's an interesting magic item. I like those sorts of magic items that are very powerful, but they give you a one-time use that ruins the magic item. So I, in one of my games, I gave my characters a, a... It was a Shadow Dark game, and I gave them a Staff of Healing so they could use it to, to basically cast the Heal spell. Um, and any class could use it. But you could also break it over someone who had just died and raise them back with one hit point. So if they do fail all their... You know, they're, they're dead, you can shatter it to, to, to heal them. And so it's a very powerful effect, but also it, it ruins it to use this effect. And so they did. They used it once to raise one of their, character, one of their party members who died. I like that. You get a wand of magic missiles, which is also a very powerful magic item here. And that's it. So the first document, 16 pages with just a little bit of art, not much. You're not talking really, this is not, um, you know, it's a free document. There's like, what, two, maybe three pieces of art. Yeah, counting the, f counting the front cover. Um, and one map, and then just a bunch of really brief descriptions of a room, which is a great dungeon, a great level three dungeon. Now, as I mentioned, this is the example dungeon given in his... Uh, cyclic Dungeon Generation document. Um, and this is what is Cyclic Dungeon Generation. He talks about his inspirations there and what you do, what this document is and what it does and what you need to, to follow along and make dungeons with him. You have these ideas of cycles, basically, and different ways of doing different kinds of cycles. It's a great I, a way to think about developing loops in your dungeons and to start jaquaying your dungeons and how to do these I, different kinds of uh, different kinds of... So basically it gives you, you know, a vocabulary and it gives you a tool set to make your own more complex dungeons, which I think is really cool. You know, it's very easy to kind of be told, jaquay your dungeon and loop it and do stuff like that. And you're like, okay, I guess I'll just do it. But this gives you a lot of good advice about different ways of making that loop interesting and making it different each time and not having the same sorts of dungeons every time. So it's a great document and I think it's really worth reviewing. Um, it's also got some good art in here. But you have the different cycles, and then how to adjust your results if you like something better than others, and then examples of the process. Uh, an example, GM, Sabrina, creating a dungeon, and eventually she develops the tomb under the tree, uh, which is this dungeon we just looked at. And so goes through, uh, and you see the different, um, the different ways that the loops work, and how it contributes, um, and all of that. So it's really cool. And uh, again, foreshadow loop start, foreshadow loop goal, false goal start, false goal fake goal, false goal real goal, and then two keys real goal. Um, and so there's different ways of doing it. So it's just a cool um, example of this particular adventure. And you get a description briefly of what's going on here. And it's basically the same. Um, it's just presented in a different format. You might like this one better because it comes with the examples. And it comes with actually some additional art a little bit. And then you have a link to Source of Victory's Link Tree page. All right, so that's a great Tomb of the Dust Queen, great uh, adventure. 
The second one of these is The Lost Caves of the Worm Witch, which is a deadly third level Shadow Dark or Dungeon Delve compatible with the Shadow Dark RPG. So it's built for Shadow Dark. It says compatible with, but that's what it's built for. Um, a really fantastic adventure. Once again, Sword and Sorcery Dungeon Delve designed for third level characters. So Sword and Sorcery gives you a tone uh, and a vibe here. An adventure background, and it's a really cool idea. There's this uh, sort of desert wasteland where there was a... Uh, a worshiping of this creature um, and then this purple worm bursts through and ruins everything and yet she's not dead this priestess who worshiped this scorpion temple and then there are uh, different parts of this adventure you have the abandoned temple itself you have the tunnel settlements because the the you're following where the purple worm tunneled through and so you go through these tunnels that the purple worm has made into the into the earth and then you find the lost caves which is the the, the sanctum of the worm witch um, a good D8 table for rumors, and you know, do not tell the characters true or falsity about these rumors. I'm I'm actually less keen on true or false rumors. What I prefer is something more like um, those rumors that are vague, and then they can be taken multiple ways. And then maybe if you have more specificity, maybe you have like two or three uh, entries for each rumor. That way you give each character a rumor, and if you roll the same result, then then the second character gets the more specific rumor or something like that, right? So I like that idea better than true or false rumors. But the, the false rumor is just, like, I get it. Like, it's good to, to get players the idea that not everything they hear about the dungeon, not every NPC that they talk to is going to be reliable. But if you just start off with characters knowing rumors, then they're going to assume they're important. And if it's just fake, especially one like the Colossal, it's number six, right? The Colossal Purple Worm Ghoul will not devour a mortal branded with a scorpion sigil, provided they lay down all weapons and remove all armor. Well, that's not true. And if a player does that, they're just going to get eaten and they're going to feel like you lied to them. So unless they're very... Yeah, like I don't like sort of rumors like that. So anyway, rumor table is useful. The true-false thing I'm not so keen on. But then there's a really cool mechanic... Yeah, it's sort of a, you might say gimmick, but I think it's kind of a fun element to this adventure where you find these songbooks throughout and you roll uh, the song type, the adjective, and then the noun. And then you're supposed to ask people to invent around the table and sing the first lines of the song. And then you go around the table and have people try to rhyme with the first line and you have everybody do one line. And then when you come to the end of it, based on kind of what the song said, you give them a boon if they find that. So they, basically, the first time they find it, the first time they find a song book, you roll up the title, you say, what's the song? What's it like in the book? And then you develop a, a sort of boon that goes along with that song, which I think is great. It's a great idea. Um, I don't think everybody's going to be into it, but I think it's really fun. Now, there's a cursed song book that can go along with that which makes it uh, it's, it's the opposite. <laughs> it's a bad thing, and it's a curse that goes along with the, uh, the effect. Um, then you get the abandoned temple itself. This is the first area. It's just eight rooms, but it's a cool area uh, for this dungeon. You get a D4 random encounter table, because this area is pretty short. You're probably not going to have that many random encounters here. Um, once again, you have the danger level, how the area is lit, and then the descriptions of the entries. Really, really well formatted once again bullet points bolding Im italics very simple to read very easy to read. you could read this on the fly you could run this adventure basically on the fly if you had to um tiered necropolis the hall of sacred stingers idol and chime uh and the sacred scorpion dust trap with a great example here for how this works then you have um you have the altar camp and the man scorpion mound which I find pretty cool. I like this idea of man scorpions. I've always liked that idea. It's really cool creatures. And there are these skeletons. That's even cooler. Um, oops. And then you get the venom baths, which is pretty horrifying. And then the purple worm tunnel, which leads a quarter mile north to part two, which is this tunnel settlement. Once again, you get this is an unsafe area, so it's a little bit safer. Um, you get the purple worm tunnels with kobold bones. Um, Pretty small area as well. Just a few rooms, but just enough to kind of give you an interesting, uh, you know, area to explore a few caves to go into. You find things happening there, Kobold Warrens, uh, Azorn Alcove, Mask of the Gem Eater. That's really cool. Um, and then you have the Lost Caves, which is the last section. Um, 
So you have a purple worm die, which this purple worm ghoul is still alive and it's going around trying to devour. Um, this is a much bigger area, right? So you've got 31 rooms here. 32 rooms. Uh, 33, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, even 34. If, yeah, I, I totally missed the middle room there. 34 rooms, so, uh, but it starts at 14, obviously. Cool random encounters with this possibility of the ghoul, or the ghoul uh, purple worm, which is pretty dangerous. I mean, a, a purple worm running around is dangerous, but you have this puzzle, sort of, with the, uh, with the uh, faces, at least these carved faces. You have petrified hill giants, you have a bodak, but it's a mermaid bodak, which is a really cool idea. Uh, then there's a lesser worm witch shrine, um, the crum crumbling bridge, uh, brazier mounds, mosaics, mausoleums, and, and again, I haven't played these adventures, but they're good, and I think that I would play any of them. And again, you get so much of this stuff, great ideas, great design, um, and it's all free. Great piece of art there, of the Worm Witch, perhaps. Um, and then he has ideas that, you know, you could continue on. The Great Underground River leads deeper into unknown mega dungeons. So there is another place that you can go, and one of the books that you get in the book has secrets that you might use to develop more adventures after this. Creatures that you can run into, a woman-sized zombie cleric, a woman scorpion zombie cleric, a man scorpion skeleton, kobolds and blast spores, um, the bodak mermaid, a giant demon, Fomorian giants, a bee here, a dracolisk, purple worm ghoul. Like, this is definitely not... Um, yeah, the Worm Witch is a vampire bard. It's awesome. And she calls the Purple Worm Ghoul when reduced to 20 hit points or less. Which is, you know, very dangerous. You now have to face her and this Purple Worm Witch is coming soon. Um, a great adventure. But there's some great magic items that go along with it. Of course, there's Boots of Dancing, which are cursed. The boots of Scorpion Kind, and instead of Spider Climb, you get Scorpion Climb, which is cool. Uh, two, plus two Charming Plate Mail, which is really good. Plus two bonus to AC in addition to the 15 you get from having chain mail in the first place. So this is really strong. Plus you have advantage on charisma checks and you can cast charm person once per day. Really strong magic item. Bracers of armor for wizards. A cloak of poisonousness, which is cursed. Chime of a man scorpion. Cloak of scorpion kind. Looking glass shields. And then the manuals and tomes, which you could find here. Um, or at least maybe rules for them. Really strong. Plus two to a relevant ability score once. Ring of Spell Storing, uh, Scroll of Bones to Scorpions, which is great instead of Sticks to Snakes, <laughs> uh, which is a great spell there. And then you have some of the uh, maybe handouts you could give, like a little page that would uh, give to your players, like if they find a map, a map somewhere in the adventure. And of course, all these files or documents, uh, you get all the maps and stuff in a separate document. So Lost Caves of the Worm Witch is a great adventure. It's pretty short. Uh, all of these are, none of them are Mega Dungeons, right? These are shortish adventures you play in a few sessions, but they're great, and they are um, really, really strong, well-designed adventures. And again, I think I would, I would play and probably will play any or all of these, especially once I get the books in print. The last of these is Shrine of the Jaguar Princess. This is a deadly fourth-level dungeon delve, so it's a little bit harder even than the Worm Witch, which is already pretty hard, I think, especially for third-level characters. You're dealing with strong creatures. Um, this is for fourth. It's Deadly Sword and Sorcery Dungeon Delve, designed for fourth level characters. This one is sort of a jungle in the forest with this long lost civilization, along a, a, pirates sailing along a Hyborian kingdom. So it's very sword and sorcery. It's very much in this idea of a yeah, different um, vibe. Here you're dealing with a po poisonous catacombs leading to, leading to the, the city of gold, miniature city of gold, in the middle of the ziggurat. And then there's a portal which leads you beyond to the devoured star, to the lair of the star ear, Mictlan, which is really cool. So you, this is much more sort of cosmic adventure. A little bit of like Cthulhu, right? Uh, you know, well, I guess it fits much more with the sword and sorcery Conan, who's often running afoul of you know these these spirits and creatures that are well beyond the power level of the actual world. Uh, some shrine legends, again, true or false. Once again, same thing as the last book. And then this one is you have vices. So for each member of the party, you either choose or roll for a vice. And there are going to be certain things in the dungeon that trigger based on which vice they have. Um, and then you pick a particular category of treasure 
that you are greedy for. Potions, scrolls, weapons, rods, staves, or staves, rings, or gemstones. Um, so each time a character indulges their greed to create a duplicate of an item they just found, which is one of the things they can do. Uh, each member of the party takes a cumulative minus two penalty to all checks to resist monster traps or effects. So there's certain things that they can do throughout the dungeon to duplicate. Um, so it says here, when you find a copy of an item, you may find a second copy of that item. Whenever you find one, you can find two. But if you do so, you get a minus two to all checks versus monster shuffle attacks or trap effects. It's a kind of cool meta mechanic, right? So you can get more treasure and more rewards, but now you're going to be uh, you know, suffering more consequences as you go through. It's kind of an interesting idea. I'm, I'm surprised more games haven't done something like that built into the base mechanic of the system or the game, because that sounds like something you could really easily do. Um, high risk, high reward. Um, and it's case by case, so you're like, oh, this is really good, I just found a really good scroll, I'm going to duplicate it. Okay, minus two to everybody. Um, you have a starting adventure, and how you start off, the pirate queen who kind of is leading you there. And there are special rules for poison gas and how that works, um, and you can use them to, to do some harmful effect for a character, <laughs> and what you can spend them on. So here's the poisonous catacombs, which is the introduction you fall through into the uh, pillared room, the statued room. Uh, which is the first level. So the danger level is unsafe, some random encounters, and some poison gas effects. You have a clay warrior gallery. Um, yeah, so I'll go back to the map here. You have uh, some pretty good, again, cyclical dungeon generation here. You can take and go straight down the middle, but obviously there's going to be complications for going straight down the middle. <laughs> and then you can take either the right or left ways uh, out of this central room if you can find them. Um, and then you can find... Uh, or actually, you know, I think, come to think of it, I think 8 and 12 go down. So I think you go up into 3 and then you choose which way you go. Yeah, that looks, that's that's where I get. So you actually start at 1 <laughs> and then you just loop around. Uh, yeah, that's right. Vampire Mist Monoliths. Vampire Mists, uh, really cool there. The Embalming Bath, great places where Jaguar mummification rules. Character is considered undead if you happen to be mummified and become a were Jaguar. Um, Nahuatl, the Revelator. Um, sleeping Jaguar the size of an elephant. And this is very much, we're talking Conan the Barbarian, right? Like this is these large creatures. Um, now this guy's an elder gibbering mouther Jaguar. Because he's got hundreds of straining eyes and fanged mouths. Really creepy. Hall of Thunder, but a, a great idea. What happens if the temple collapse? Um... And how it was destroyed. You have the root of the world. It's an ancient tree with faces, or a face on it. A royal tomb, and then you've got this awesome, gross elder flail snail. <laughs> um, great ideas. Uh, cool tombs there, the Eye of Miklan. This is just the first level of the dungeon. And then you get to the city itself, the miniature city, which is sort of uh, waist high as you enter. Um, and so it's this big city down below. Um, and then you can continue forward, obviously, with various... Um, once you get to the portal. There's a portal that leads you beyond this place entirely. Um, but to find it isn't necessarily easy. Gold sealed clay doors. You can inspect the buildings. Um, all the miniature buildings aren't actually gold, but they're gold plated, and so you can take the whole city of all of its gold plating, which is 2,500 gold pieces, and you have to roll on the shrine events table when you take the gold and leave. Because, um, you know, stuff's happening. You can't just do it with no consequences. It's a necropolis, uh, the priests of gold. Um, and so basically it says, warn characters before they kneel so the priests judge you, right? Kneel, speak your greed, and pray the star eater finds you worthy. So you can do it. Um, roll a d6 to determine if the molten gold jet trap is triggered. Speaking their greed is a risk reward, uh, risk versus reward choice. So again, you tell them, hey, if you do this, something bad can happen, but something really good can happen too. Um, skull sepulchers with random contents on each of them. Um, the Underworld Scourge depicts hideous creatures with body of iguana and head of a furry bat. 
Um, you can take a lot of damage. The average damage of 100d6 is 350 if you prefer not to roll 100 dice. Because they can take 300d6 damage. Um, theoretically. Or 100d6 damage, excuse me. Which is hilarious. Uh, then you have uh, the Jaguar Princess herself. The Path of Ascension. Um, and then the Evan Disc of First Offering. And then beyond that, you have the Boy Prince Corpse. Beyond that, you have the Devoured Star. Which is danger level. Do not check for random encounters, as the Devoured Star is a small isolated rock in an orbit a thousand miles above the Earth. It's a small place. But you step through the portals from the various places, and uh, or from the place you're coming from, and you fight, or you can, uh, Mictalan himself. Um, his Icor drifts through space, where we land another planet, and reconstitutes his form at 5d100 years. Um, so you can just go right back. Um, and then there's monsters. Um, really cool creatures. This summer designed specifically for this adventure. And uh, pretty straightforward stuff here. But I think cool. Plus two deer leather armor. Plus two jaguar bone mace. And a, a protection against turning. An undead creature wearing this amulet cannot be turned. So, you know, good thing to have uh, around, I suppose. Good thing for an evil creature to get a hold of an evil character or an evil... Um, Maybe villain, if you have a necromancer in the party who can raise the dead. Maybe he gives his most powerful minion this. And he can't be turned by enemy clerics. Uh, circlet of the Clay Titans. Uh, golden Jaguars. Potions. Preserved Eyes of Mictlan. Ring of Delusion. A Sacred Piercing Kit of Noctli. Noctli. Scrolls. And then Shrine Events. So this is what's happening if you um, are entering into this dungeon. Every time you come back in, you have to roll on what's going on here. And there's some really cool things happening. So you can make this much more a living dungeon with something interesting happening throughout the whole place um, as you go through. And that's it. Now, keep in mind, these three adventures are free. So why wouldn't you get them? Even if you don't play Shadow Dark, great ideas for your own dungeons or just to mine them. I mean, you might as well pick up every free adventure you can. <laughs> and if you do want them in print, you can get them from Lulu. They're a little expensive, and, and I'm not impressed with Lulu shipping right now, I have to say. Um, they have been very... Uh, I don't know if it's them or if it's the post office, but I, my shipment is way long delayed. So, um, But, you know, I can't... It's obviously that time of year when people are ordering stuff, so who knows? But regardless, you can get them for free at least. Again, I'll put links to the description of his link tree below, um, where he has a lot of other stuff too, 5e adventures and, and independent games. Even, I think, a browser adventure game where, like, in the style of, like, old, like, uh, well, what's that game? Ultima. Like, Ultima 1 or 2. Um, something like that. <laughs> I've played, like, a couple of minutes of it. It's actually pretty cool. A dungeon delver. But anyway, you can find that all in the link below. I hope this has been interesting, guys, and I'll talk to you all later.